happy that you all are enjoying front-end sessions. And uh, it's a great honor for me and privilege to introduce uh, our next speaker, Mark Walton. He is a, a designer. He runs a, a design shop in Cardiff, Wales. And uh, I am almost sure that most of you know that he has designed uh, the home of Drupal, the Drupal.org. He made a redesign of that and also designed the logo, the branding for Drupal itself. Uh, he's been involved in uh, Drupal community since 2008. Uh, he's attended and spoke at several uh, DrupalCons. Uh, he's also an author and uh, a publisher of uh, Five Steps. And it's a series or a collection of books by different authors about the design process. So I'm not going to take much time. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mark Walton. Thank you, thank you. Everyone hear me all right? Great, well, thank you, Joseph. What a, what a great, uh, it's really great to be here. I haven't been at a DrupalCon for two years. Uh, I was just saying it feels like things are quite different to the last time I spoke at a DrupalCon, which was in Copenhagen. This is my fifth or something DrupalCon. Uh, it's much bigger. Uh, I can't believe the amount of hands that were up this morning who's this is their first. If this is your first DrupalCon, welcome. Um, so today I'm going, to, uh, I'm, going to talk about, I'm going to talk about a few things. I'm going to talk about CERN, which is a project I've been working uh, on for about 18 months. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about CERN and what a great, crazy place it is and how many similarities it has with the Drupal community, actually. Uh, and then I'm, but it, kind of sitting around that, I want to talk about designing in a, in a community. How many of you are designers? Right. Okay. How many of you are actively contributing to the Drupal community and the Drupal project as designers? How are you finding that? A couple of giggles. Right. Oh, yeah, it's hard. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about that and what I've learned over the past you know, four years of, of working with similar communities, similar organizations, similar projects. Uh, and hopefully there'll be one or two things that you can take away today that may make your job a little bit easier. Uh, but one thing that I'm going to talk about, first of all, and don't worry, this doesn't have any sound, um, is I'm going to talk about screwing up. I'm going to talk about failure and about how failure is really important to what we do as designers. Yet, in, in, in our schooling as designers, it's drummed out of us at a very, very early time in our schooling that failure is, uh, is frowned upon. And actually, thinking about it, failure is frowned upon in society from, from a very early age, actually. Not much older than these kids. And it's mostly to do with school. Uh, so these, these two lovely little <laughs> toddlers trying to work out what they're stairs for, uh, and they're, they're being filmed, and they're being filmed by their parents or, or friends or, uh, you know, uh, people who just enjoy watching babies fall flat on their face, uh, which happens, right? And they, um, and they get up. But the critical thing at this age is that you are, and I have two small kids myself, um, you're encouraged. When this happens, your parent doesn't go, loser, you're a loser, baby and walk away. No. When a baby falls over, you smile, you laugh, you give it encouragement. You, of course, you say, you know, oh, dear, we'll go to a hospital with that broken nose. Uh, but you, you, you know, you, you, you don't chastise it. Now, is anybody a snowboarder? Okay, a few people. Right. So I started snowboarding, oh, I don't know, it was about seven years ago, something like that. And uh, me and my, no, it was a bit longer, it was about 10 years ago. Me and my wife, uh, um, my girlfriend at the time, she, not and my girlfriend at the time, that would be weird. She was my girlfriend at the time. I'm now married to her. Let me clear that right up. Because <laughs> this thing is being televised. Uh, so... Uh, we, that's totally throw me, we, we arrived in Austria, a uh, lovely little village, it was, um, uh, the snow hadn't been good, no surprise there, so we, we booked some lessons, and you know, you, you turn up and there's a whole bunch of other people 
who were also booked on lessons. And you go up the, up the, um, up the cable car. Now, they didn't tell us how to use a cable car, right? Well, this is actually was a chairlift, a two-man chairlift. So uh, we <laughs> never used a cable, never used a chairlift before. And it's a little two-man thing. So you, you know, you're holding the board because it's not on your feet at this point. It's a really sticky bit on the floor there. It's really putting me off. So you, um, you, ho you hold on to your board because you don't clip in, right? And you, you sort of stand like this, waiting for the, for the chairlift to come round, and it, and it smacks you on the back of the legs, and whoosh, up you go, and with, with quite some considerable speed, right? Chairlift is not on gears like, a, like a, a cable car, which starts you off really slowly, and then, no, it just smacks you, and away you go. So we're, we're on this thing, and it's rocking as it does on, on the way up, and it goes really high, really fast. And we didn't realize that you had to pull down the thing. So I'm quite scared of heights. So I'm clutching, I'm trying to hold my snowboard and clutching onto this. So this is one part of failure, right? And you get to the top. And they, they tell you how to clip into your board. And there we use these like clipping ones so you didn't have to worry about straps and everything. And then you, you, get, you get on a hill that's about this high. And then you, you go and you go about this far. And you're like, yes, that was amazing. And you do that a few times, and it's cruel. Because it builds up your confidence and your ability. <laughs> All of a sudden, you think you're a snowboarder, right? And then they leave you. The instructor's like, right, that's the end of the lesson today. And everyone's doing this, and everyone's feeling great. Yeah. But in public. Uh, and they leave you, and they go, and they say, right, uh, we'll see you tomorrow. The slopes are yours. Off you go. Now <laughs> you just think you can go down a red run or something. So you try that and you fall on your backside repeatedly in the same place for a week. Snowboarding, learning to snowboard is more about pain management than it is about learning a new skill. It's more about how willing are you to put up with falling on that same spot to the point where when you do it, your, your, back, your body tries to deny it's just happened by kind of thrusting forwards, and you're like, oh, you know, hitting that one same bruise. My point is, uh, when, you, when you snowboard, learn to snowboard, you do what those toddlers were doing, is that you fail in public. And the support that you get from the people around you, <laughs> if they're the nice kind of people, they don't shout loser at you when you fall on your same bit and your backside tries to deny the reality of the situation. Now, designers, I'm a designer, I've been for a long time, uh, we're, we're, we're taught to go and s get a brief from a client, right, and go and squirrel away in a little room and come out with the solution. Ta-da, I solved your problem. Here it is. What do you think? Okay, I'll change a few things. Ta-da, there it is. It's a very personal, sometimes secretive process. Um, and that can have a, it can have a, you know, it's good. Some good things come out of it, right? Simplicity, perfection. These are things that are born from people crafting and squirreling away on something for hours and hours and hours. But the closer you get to perfection, the easier you can see the cracks like a whitewash wall, right? The closer you get to something that is so minimalistic, so perfect in its form, uh, the easier the mistakes are to see. Now, some would say that that is a symptom of the process. That's a symptom of a designer not giving up, squirreling away. But the, what, what can happen that is bad is that it can, it can affect uh, organizations that right across product ranges, right across core... Uh, what they do. So an example of this is um, airlines, right? Business, uh, business class being a great example, is that um, the business class experience for long haul is supposed to take the complete stress out of the, out of the situation, out of the travel. You, it is not supposed to be an arduous thing, traveling business class. It's supposed to be pleasant. They're getting closer to perfection, right? So when the cracks do appear, and they do, they seem so much worse. So I was flying back from the Middle East last year, and it was an overnight flight to London. 
and uh, I was flying business class, and I sat in, it was late, it was like 1 a.m. when we set off, and I sat one down in my seat, and um, you know, they come around with drink and hot milk, or, you know, it's nice, right? That's what business class is, nice. But then they come around with, well, they did with it, and I thought, I thought this was weird, and this was a crack. They came around with pajamas. So they're like, pajamas, Mr. Bolton, and I was like, okay. So I took the pajamas, and I was like, what am I supposed to do with these? Right, so I'm looking around the cabin, seeing other people taking pajamas. I'm like, right, I'm not going to make the first move. So I'm seeing what other people are doing with these pajamas. And uh, thankfully, nobody did make the first move, and I didn't have to go and then have the embarrassing situation of working out how far do I go with my clothes, and where do I put them afterwards? You know, all of these things. Now, that's a company who didn't think through that experience with that simple question. Uh, this also happened in, uh, in, this happens in hotels. It's happened to me twice now. I've arrived at a hotel and there's no reservation and they've given me a meeting room. So I've slept in a meeting room. Well, I mean, the swag is better from the hotel room. I've got pens and bulldog clips and all sorts from this. Uh, you know, I'm sick of shampoo. So anyway, the whole point of that little rant about a few things was that it really goes to the theme of, of this whole conference, which is opening up. And it's something that we as designers don't do naturally. Either through our, uh, just by being who we are, what we do, uh, our schooling, for me personally, was through the way I was taught. So when we, uh, when CERN approached us uh, a couple of years ago, they said, it was an amazing telephone call. They, they said, um, hi, it's CERN. I was, <laughs> I was about to go, yeah, right, whatever and put the phone down. They're like, no, no, it really is. Uh, can we chat? Because we have a problem with our content, and we have a problem in that we're a large, complicated, vocal community with very little hierarchy. And after seeing how you worked with the Drupal community, we think you'd be the, the man for the job, if you're up for it. Uh, so after a bit of back and forth, uh, we started on the project. So who's heard of CERN, right? Probably most of you, that's why you're here. Uh, CERN is a flat-out bonkers place. It's brilliant. It, it straddles the border between um, France and Switzerland. It's in Geneva. Uh, CERN is like a really dodgy, old-looking university campus with knackered buildings and loads of physicists walking around. Uh, and, and other people too. But it's, um, to all this, you know, first looking at it, it just looks like a university. Well, it was where the web was invented. This is the actual next box that Tim Berners-Lee uh, invented the web. Um, there's a sticker on it that says this. Uh, this machine is a sir. Do not power down. Um, it's kept in a little box, a little display cabinet. In, in CERN, uh, it's quite, you know, physicists aren't really into kind of like making a big deal out of things like that. It's just like, eh, it's a computer. Like, <laughs> and they're going, it's the web, it's the web. They're going, eh, are you coming? I'm like, <laughs> um, and then, then they sh then, so there's, I mean, there's, there's so much stuff here. Every time I go there, I, I, my jaw drops. I have these moments of just like, what? Because of the crazy stuff they're doing, but also the crazy stuff that I see. So this is the um, this is the, basically the server farm where the uh, the experiments, all the data comes out of the experiments. So for, uh, that is on the LHC, which is the Light Large Hadron Collider. Uh, the, the the amount of data that's coming into here is well, there are about 600 million collisions a second going on in the LHC. Uh, the computer discards maybe two-thirds of that, but keeps 200 million collisions a second, and all of that is stored here uh, in lots and lots and lots of computers. Uh, just to give a sense of the scale of the thing, right? this extends probably about the same distance that way and a little bit that way. All of that is for the LHC. This tiny little thing in the top left-hand corner behind the yellow is the internet. Tiny. 
but it's the European backbone. There literally is a big pipe behind there. And then there's a few other things which power things like search and stuff like that. So there's a lot of stuff. What a lot of people don't know is that CERN is a complex of accelerators. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's also the home of the best typography in the world. Uh, <laughs> check that out. It is futuristic. Um, so what happens is, we're just trying to explain a little bit about what happens. So the LHC is a collider, but before the protons, which incidentally come out of a little bottle about that big, about the size of a, of a lemonade bottle, and th that is enough for about, I think it's about 200 million years of, of youth protons in that. Um, so they're like protons attached somewhere here, and they go firing down there, and they get sped up, and they get accelerated and accelerated through these different accelerators and boosters, and then they get, poof, they get thrown into the collider. They don't accelerate in the collider. They just go around and get smashed into each other at four points. So LHCB, which is an experiment over on the right, Atlas, CMS, and ALICE, which is over, over there. So, and they're all looking for different stuff. Um, CMS and Atlas are looking for similar things. Uh, and I talked about the typography. Check that out. It's full of great things like that and signs that say cavern. <laughs> and uh, this was when we went to see the CMS detector. So we actually were lucky enough to see this. So just to give a sense of scale, uh, let me just look on that because that's properly ropey. Uh, okay, yeah. So this, this little thing over here, that's a dude. Right, so this thing, the cavern is about twice as high as this room and twice as long. The machine itself is about a third higher of this room again and a little bit longer than this room. And what happens is, is uh, this thing here, see, the, we're very lucky on that day. That's the beam pipe. So that, that little pipe there, so that's where the protons go in. That is a single piece of beryllium that, that spans the length of the, of the machine. Uh, so there, it was, it was all exposed. That was very exciting. It wasn't excited as the other people who were with me. They were, they were all like, <gasps> they were like Muppets. <laughs> um, they were very, I was like, it's just a pipe. It's just a metal pipe. Um, there's also, well, the, the thing about CERN is that it's got very, very unique problems, right? One of which is signage. They needed a sign for a dead dude. Uh, <laughs> And this, this is for uh, in case there's a helium leak, right? Each one of the magnets is filled with helium. And if that leaks, you're dead, basically. So it's like, woo, warning, dead. And it, when I saw this, I was just howling. I was, this was rather embarrassing, because everyone would just walk straight past this and looking at the beryllium pipe. And I was like, check this side out. And I'm photograph. I'm wetting myself laughing. Uh, spot the designer. Um, Sorry, I was <laughs> very funny. Uh, this is, this is, so as well as the big experiments that you see on TV and stuff that Brian Cox talks about all the time, things like that, there's a whole load of other experiments going on at CERN. CERN is actually the infrastructure, right? It provides the beam, the beam, basically the beam of protons, right? It gives it to various experiments, and those experiments do stuff with it. So this is, a, this is a, called a Zolder, which is a... Crazy. looks like just plumbing and tinfoil and crazy guys hanging out at the top there. Uh, so what, what this is, is, is the beam comes into a zolder and, and they do stuff with it. There's a brilliant experiment in a zolder called WITCH, um, which stands for Weak Interaction Trap for Charged Particles. They so made up that name to fit the word WITCH. Um, but it's only ever worked once, and it blew up then. Every time they try and turn it on, it blows up. Um, I think the only time it did work was on a full moon. So it's got this picture of a witch on the side of it. And they're like, oh, that's a witch. And I was like, that's cool. That's such a cool story. And they're, they're you know, physicists. They're like, mm, it's very interesting. Um, this is uh, Jasper. And he runs an experiment called Cloud. Get this. They're making clouds. At CERN. Now, to, to do this, they needed the cleanest environment. 
Because I didn't know this, but clouds are made from bits of stuff, right, which moisture attaches to, and then they build and it turns into clouds. Uh, and algae, turns out algae get stressed. This is a great, this is, I, I hope this is true, and please, if it's not, nobody come up to me and be a smart ass afterwards and say, you know that algae story? Well, actually, because I don't want to know. I like this. Algae get stressed in the sea. There's algae just lying there in the, in the heat. They lie me under these lights. Uh, and then it goes, oh, you know, it's really too hot, and spits out biomass. So, and this floats up, and it creates clouds. And then the clouds shade the algae, and it goes, oh, it's better. <laughs> How cool is that, if it's true, which I really hope it is. Um, so cloud, uh, cloud is an experiment where they're doing this kind of thing. They're making clouds, not with algae. Stress algae, yeah, they're torturing algae in there. Yeah, you're hot enough yet. Uh, they're, they're, um, they're making uh, clouds, and then they're firing the beam at these clouds to see what happens. Now, the beam going into cloud isn't like tiny, tiny, like in a beryllium pipe. It's really big. It's like this, big beam. Uh, now, they, they had to make the cleanest environment on Earth, and then they had to make the cleanest water on Earth so that they, you know, there were no contaminants in there. Very, very cool problems, very interesting, interesting ways. Uh, you know, we need the cleanest water, so they just go and make it. That, that's the cool thing about CERN, is that the problems that they have there are quite unique. So they just go and make stuff. So who's got an iPhone? Or, or similar, smart touch device, right? Uh, the capacitive touch screen in your smart touch enabled device was invented in CERN in the 70s as a, a, a way to cope with the, the amount of controls in the control, uh, in the control rooms. So it was, you know, so we need a touch screen, uh, but it needs to be, you know, interesting problem. And there's a lot of knowledge share that goes on. So there's a lot of these things that are solved and then get put out into industry. CAT scanners, they do a lot of medical research stuff because uh, they've got loads of radiation that they don't really need. <laughs> like, well, let's radiate stuff and give it to those people. Right, so what did we, so that's CERN, right? Uh, so what did we actually do? Well, on the project. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Drupal, but it's gonna be at the end. So if, you wait, if, you, if you're waiting for the Drupal bit, uh, it's, you're in for a bit of a wait. Um, nobody leaving, that's good. Right, so we spent a long time uh, researching the project. It was funny, we went, our original proposal kind of had, you know, quite a bit of research budgeted in. And they went, ah, uh, you might need to, slightly amend that. Um, we, we spent maybe six or seven months uh, talking and designing, mostly talking, mostly conducting interviews with, with uh, users, with stakeholders. There's a, the, the, the issue is, is that it's a very, very flat organization. So the stakeholder, there isn't one, one guy in charge just saying, yeah, signed off, build it. Um, it's, it's just not like that similar to the Drupal organization, uh, except there wasn't a Dries in CERN. So we, um, we spent a long time uh, talking to people in the experiment. So I mentioned that CERN provides the beam. Uh, it, it provides the infrastructure, uh, so IT, uh, personnel, um, engineering to a degree, uh, and, and it it gives the beam to the experiments. All of these other experiments are also individual communities. Sometimes just of a few people, but in other times in the case of Atlas or Alice, several thousand people. And each group of stakeholders needed to be involved in some way in the conversation. So how do you manage that? Well, first of all, we just ignored it all. And we concentrated on the, on the, the, the people using the website. There's a danger in projects of this scale, similar to the Drupal Association, is that you can get terribly sucked into, um, into the problems of the project without actually stepping out and spending real quality time with the people using the website, the system, the software, whatever it is you're working on. So we did a lot of that. And the, we, whenever we work on a project, we try and model the audience. Um, I find personas work very well for me. They may not work well for you. Uh, there are other ways in which you can model your audience. I get a lot out of personas simply because uh, the very creation of them 
helps me understand their needs and their motivations. So we, we did a survey. We did some quantitative stuff. So we did a survey on, on, the, on the, the CERN website. We had about 3,000 respondents in like three days or something ridiculous. Turns out people really like filling in surveys on the CERN website. Uh, well now we crunch that data manually. A lot of it was open-ended questions. There was some stuff like, you know, some uh, things like age and gender and things like that. But a lot of it was, why are you here? What are you doing? Just getting the context around it. And then we tallied repetitive phrases. So you'll see over on the right there. We tallied a lot of these repetitive phrases. Now you get a sample that large and those repetitive phrases will come out. So it's a total, <laughs> we were stuck in a room losing the will to live for about a week. The three of us just going, oh, this is rubbish. Why did we do this? But we had to, you know that thing where you're waiting for a bus and you've waited, like it's 20 minutes late and you're like, I'm, I'm here now. I've got to, I've got to keep going. It was like that. So uh, let me just go back. So what was very interesting is that it broke down the audience into four major, four key personas. Students, which was by far the largest audience group that, that is using CERN or was filling in the survey at the time. Uh, actually, that research was further added to throughout the course of the kind of six or seven months when it, it played out. Then there are teachers. Um, teachers are really interesting because they, uh, they mostly logistical, their interactions with CERN, so they want to find uh, lesson plan material and that kind of thing, um, or they want to come and visit CERN, or they like to keep up on their subject, if they're physics teachers or whatever. Uh, scientists and researchers use CERN a lot, uh, and they're looking for very specific information, updates on specific information, and they're highly knowledgeable about their subject area. And then we have the general public, who are generally... <laughs> Generally a bit dumb where it's where CERN's concerned. They're like, is it gonna blow up? Um, are they making black holes? Am I gonna die tomorrow? There's a lot of fear. We were quite surprised about that. Those came up quite a lot. You'll see. Uh, actually, you won't in this one. Maybe it's down the bottom. Uh, but what what that was very useful because it, it gave us a sense of what are people coming there across all of the user groups. Uh, and the one thing that came out time and time again, and you'll see all of those lines across the top right, uh, top right there were updates. People wanted to know what the hell was going on. Now, that represented a real challenge for us because these four audience groups span complete numpties, like the general public, who are going to die, to physicists, particle physicists, high-energy physicists, who use the word femtobarm in everyday language. So our job was to like, right, so we've got to provide content in a meaningful way to, from, from general public, this end, to high energy physicist. I don't know why I did those voices. Um, so we created these personas and we mapped their, these keywords that we got on a, on a, a kind of a graph, it's fairly arbitrary, but you can see where some dip above this line. Um, and we can say that, well, for general public, they want to know what's going on. They want updates. They want progress of the LHC. Uh, they want to they, they learn. They want knowledge. And, and they're very curious about CERN. They want to know what's going on there. Not very trusting. Um, we really needed to understand how CERN's organizational structure worked as well. Now, uh, in any social group, maybe that's a very bold statement, my experience of any social group is that, uh, or big organization like that, is that the people who you think might be important aren't always the people that end up being important. So the, in an organization, this could be the CEO. So, you know, you, you pander to the CEO's needs. He, you know, he or she may not be the person involved in this at all. Who you really need to speak to is the head of operations or the, uh, the deputy head. Now, it could be somebody who's very vocal, uh, lots of connections, knows everybody, bit of a gossip, 
knows what's going on, and those kind of people do the politics very, very well, and they can move a project, and those are your friends. Those are the people that you really need to identify very quickly. Um, within CERN, but it, the problem with that is that it involves talking to a hell of a lot of people generally to try and identify those people. Again, those people will come out in the trends of feedback that you hear. Most people are like, oh, you need to talk to Bob in accounts. You know, and then you talk to somebody else, and they're like, Bob, Bob knows that. Speak to Bob. Um, so, yeah, CERN provides the infrastructure. It's a community. The experiments use the infrastructure, and they are a community too. I mentioned the content problem. That was one of the very first things that CERN said to us was, we've got a content problem. So we needed a strategy around the content. We needed to understand how CERN was talking about itself, how the media was talking about CERN, how stories about CERN, and there are so many wonderful stories about CERN that actually never really see the light of day because they're written in the wrong language for the wrong people. General public doesn't read it because it has the word femtobarm in it. So our, after we work with Relly Annette Baker, who's a, a really great content strategist in the UK, uh, and she spent a bunch of time speaking to a whole load of people about editorial processes, where the problems with the content are at the moment, and we defined a strategy, and we, basically an understanding of, the, of, of what the problem is. And we made a diagram. And it turns out that this diagram was the best thing that we did last year, probably. In, in trying to convey the problems that CERN has. So our diagram looks like this. Woo, orbitals, content. So the, the problem is, if you think about content this way, you have orbital content, which is the stuff that doesn't live on your site. And in fact, most of the time, you're not responsible for. And then, you, then in, in CERN's case, we have these you know, categories that are across the top. This is the content for these types of people. Then they have public content, experiments, people, and then we get down to operational content. It's very important for, you know, if there's a fire, what do I do? My toilet's broken. I need a new toilet. Th this is the important content for people in CERN. Don't ring them if your toilet's broken. Uh, they're good, but they're not that good. Departmental content is serious physics. It's, you know, it's scary stuff. Now, the problem with the, with the current site was that uh, people were going from, ooh, fluffy orbital YouTube video about some, and there are some bad songs, like CERN songs. Like, Drupal has its own song. What is it about songs? So with CERN. Uh, and the people were going from that thing on YouTube all the way down to big, scary experimental physics content. They're <laughs> like, whoa. You know, it's like being smacked in the face. Ventabomb. Oh. Um, so what we had to do was to, you know, first of all, get them to acknowledge this, get them to, you know, understand that they have a problem, and then organize the content and the creation of the content around these tiers. And in time, CERN will invest, CERN will invest more time in this orbital content because chances are, who's been to the CERN website? Be honest. Two, three, four, five, quite a few, or oh, more, quite a lot. Okay. You're in the minority. Uh, not many people go to CERN to learn about CERN because they can't when they get there. Uh, so a lot of people learn about CERN from the, 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 the media. That's a problem for CERN because their press office can't be across every little bit of content that's created. So there are some interesting things that came out of this. Things like, uh, are, are, are you going to destroy the world? And when, when it blew up a few years ago, you know, that was a real nightmare to manage for them. Uh, because they're, 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 there's a supermarket in Geneva, and about 100 meters underneath aisle 16, they're colliding particles at the speed of light. So this stuff is happening in their neighborhoods. And that's, that, that's the interesting thing that came out for me, is that this touches people in a very serious way. Going back to designers sitting in their little cupboards, I would like to say it's not a cupboard really, in their studios, you know, squirreling away, creating something perfect on their own, is not 
uh, is not conducive to uh, producing good work. I don't think. And I remember Bob Ross. Yeah. Bob Ross's hair. Uh, Bob, Bob Ross uh, was a painter, for those of you who don't know. He was on the telly in the 70s. I grew up watching Bob Ross um, all the time. No, not all the time. I, he was a... Uh, I, I drew from, uh, well, from, from a very early age, painted, had oils and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. He's a bit of a hero. And he always, he always talked about happy accidents. Ooh, happy accidents. Normally when he screwed up, right, on the telly, like, pfft, big black splodge. Ooh, I'll just turn that into a tree or a waterfall. Uh, and it was so nice when he did that. You're like, ah, oh, Bob, that's brilliant. Um, so I, 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 at some age or another in school, I decided that I didn't want to do art anymore, and I didn't want to be Bob Ross, and that I wanted to be a forensic scientist. What an idiot. So I went and did A-level art, which is like 16 to 18 year olds, I did biology, chemistry, and physics, and failed them totally publicly, embarrassingly, two N's and a U. I don't know what N means to this day. It's like nearly. You're nearly got an E. Uh, but I think it was the nature of the failing that, that made me work much, much harder. It was, the, it, it was with my peers. It was very public, embarrassing. It was awful. Mike Tyson has a great phrase that everyone has a plan until you get smacked in the face. Uh, and that is, every designer should really take that to heart, because any project will smack you in the face, quite a lot. And you need to have the ability to course correct very, very quickly. And if you're doing it, if you're designing openly, then you have to do that openly, and you have to take that hit, and take that mistake publicly, and move on. And it's really hard to do. So the way that I do that, and the way that I mitigate that is, is by fidelity. So I am much more, and this is the way I've worked for a long time, I'm much happier sketching for a long time in a project, and then at the right time, going higher fidelity. Now, higher fidelity may mean in a browser, it may mean in a Photoshop, in Photoshop, not a Photoshop. Uh, so we did this on, this is some of the really old, I found these uh, sketches from Drupal 7 that, that Lisa and I worked on uh, a few years ago. So we spent a long time at this level. This is some ridiculous content. Uh, we needed to model the audience. So we did it a whole bunch of ways before we ended up with two personas. Uh, but that's what we needed to go through. In a lot of work, you have to go through the crap to get to the good stuff. You have to go through the motion of discarding. This is where some things like web patterns on the web, I, and, and for, you know, we're, all, we're systemizing the web. We're, you know, this grid system, that grid system, this type system, this, you know, this pattern, this pattern. We're not, we're not necessarily going through the crap before we get to the good stuff. We're just using the crap. Uh, not that it's crap, but it's, it's ubiquitous, right? So we did a lot of that. We did a lot of sketching. Uh, edit in place, WYSIWYGs. They seem pretty familiar now. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of stuff. So we, we spent a long time at this stage, a lot of post-it notes. That, that gives you the ability to change direction really easily. Also, another thing about sketching uh, is that I find you get much more honest feedback from people, users and stakeholders on sketches and paper prototypes because they don't think you've invested time in them. They're throwaway. They're stuff you've done in 20 seconds. Uh, he's only spent 20 seconds on that. I'll say it's crap because that's what I think. Uh, if you've spent a long time crafting something beautiful, they're less likely to say that. So, so well, that's my, that's my experience. So Guy Kawasaki um, talked about a make mantra. He talked about this a long time ago. And it's very similar to another thing which we've used in the past called an idea brief, um, which is this, this idea of you, you take a project and a brief and you try and distill it and distill it and distill it down to a phrase or a, uh, 
a, a couple of words that is, a, is an actionable kind of springboard for ideas. Uh, or it could be used as a phrase to um, communicate something on a project. So for Drupal 7, it was, the, the, we had a bunch of design principles, but the one that stuck out time and time again was privilege as a content creator. That came, that came up and up and up throughout the whole uh, process of that project. Um, so there's a bunch of people who have those. You know, sometimes they're kind of strat lines, FedEx, peace of mind, Nike. Um, so you can use a make mantra as a guide. So when you, as you can do on a project, you meander off the point, uh, you, you can use it to pull you back. Does it answer this problem? Stick it on your wall. Um, it's a springboard for ideas. So when you're stuck, and we all have those days when, days when we're stuck, um, you can go back to it and it can help you, take you in a direction that you may not have gone. Uh, this one's a good one. Uh, is, well, particularly with CERN, right? It's a big, complicated project, big, complicated organization. And it's not simple. And there's a desire sometimes to try and make something simple. But some things just never are. And making them simple actually is doing a disservice to them. Uh, just some, sometimes things are complex. Lying about their simplicity, I find is fine. Uh, because how, you, how we use this make mantra, for example, uh, and I'll show you in a minute, is to, um, is to explain the approach. Now, that's not saying that our approach to a complex problem is a lie. It's saying that our approach to a complex problem may seem simplistic, but it's actually not. It's kind of lying. Um, big organizations freak out about change. Uh, and I think that's without exception, in my experience. A lot of organizations just simply freak out. Uh, and then it goes into committees and subcommittees and other departments, oh, it's gonna have to be signed off. Then all these stakeholders come out of the woodwork, right? We've all been there. Um, so a simple statement like this can, and what, what that is really is, is people freaking out about things they haven't heard about before. This notion of, you know, I wish I was consulted. Uh, so to, in order to consult with lots of people, your message has to be really quite simple. So that's one thing that this Make Mantra can do is, is to is, is have a simple, a simple thing to tell people. One of the problems with CERN is that it's big engineering. But, I mean, you've seen photos, pipes and tinfoil and crazy physicists behind computer screens and clouds and big magnets. Uh, my mum thinks that's boring, right? She, my mum really is not interested in that. She should be because of the story behind what CERN is doing is actually, you know, one of the most important, I think, one of the most important human endeavors on the planet. It's, it's incredibly important. Uh, and yet, she finds that boring. So we can't show pictures of magnets. Now, NASA has a really easy job of it. Because they're doing something similar. They're exploring outer space. CERN is exploring inner space. Uh, except NASA's got pictures like this. Right? And CERN's got pictures of magnets and crazy physicists. And that's not conducive to, to inspiring people. So we needed a way of inspiring people. What CERN does have are these. Now, these are event visualizations from the experiments on the LHC. So this is what happens when two particles hit at nearly the speed of light. They change into lots of other stuff that goes through the, through the experiment. So that big CMS, the big experiment, the big hexagonal one I showed you earlier, right in the beam pipe in the middle of that, there's an, ex there's an explosion of particles. And they, they get twisted and turned because of the different magnets that are in that, in that machine. And by the amount of curve and the amount of trajectory, this is the guy who got a U in physics, uh, then they can tell which particle it is and what's coming out of it. So, and these are beautiful. This one, I love this. This is cloud. Uh, just, and computers are making these from, from little particles. So CERN has this. 
So one of the things that we wanted to do was show these in a near live state. This is happening right now at CERN. The problem that we come up against is that uh, when you ask a physicist to explain this, you get stuff physicists understand. Uh, what, what I needed was, I needed to ship my mum out to Geneva, set her up in a little office, and get uh, people to bring her like, captions for these images. And uh, she would go, uh, and then they go away and do it again. That's, that didn't happen, <laughs> but it would have been awesome if it had been. Um, so we needed to understand how we talk about what's going on here to different people, those different audience groups, right? Some general public, uh, physicist, really smart. So we came up with ways of uh, tracking this, ways of talking about it to people, like I'm talking about it to you now, is that generally there is, a, there is a degradation of comprehension of what these things are from scientists who are really smart to general public who are really dumb. Uh, now, what we needed to do was have an inverse scale there applied of wonder. So I talk about the wonder in the same way that NASA inspires my four-year-old daughter to look at pictures of stars. She's not going to do that with magnets. So but equally, a scientist is going to get really fed up if you're ramming all this highly visual stuff down their throat 24-7. So as uh, comprehension goes down, wonder goes up. Turns out the dumb general public really like shiny things. And the scientists really don't. Just give them femta bombs. Uh, so what's happening on the project? This is what's happening. This is, uh, we're, this is the home page. And we're, um, we're working through, one of the things that people said they needed was updates. How, uh, what's going on? And there's different ways of telling that story to different people. Sometimes uh, it could be that uh, there's a shutdown. Uh, we're closed for two months, which is what happens. Uh, in fact, CERN's going to be closed for a couple of years for all kinds of um, upgrades and stuff very soon. Uh, so there are those stories that aren't that important, aren't that interesting. Then there are stories that uh, need more explanation. So we have stories with links, stories without links, updates without links. But then when something happens, something is noteworthy. So we needed a different display of these updates. So this is a noteworthy display when they thought they'd you know, those uh, neutrinos had broken the speed of light. It just turned out to be a dodgy wire. Um, they needed a way of saying this thing is important. So it's more important to this other stuff. So it's going to go sticky at the top and it's going to have an image. Uh, because uh, mo going back to that orbital content, most people are going to be hearing about this outside of the sun site. And they're going to be coming here for, you know, from the horse's mouth. They're going to be coming here for the truth. So it needed to be big. Uh, the other thing is when uh, so there's a significant event, a significant uh, story, there needs to be a different display on there to prop that up. So we have a, this is where we'll have full, full screen photography. We'll have a high contrast caption to the story at the top. The next thing you may have seen a few months ago, which we actually did, which was a roadblock. So this was when there was the announcement. I had to sit on that story for about a day and a half. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. I sat there like that on my hands with my mouth shut for a, for a day. It was very exciting. Uh, but we were under complete embargo. Like, we couldn't talk about it. Um, so this is where the whole site just disappears. And one story is up. Now, this, this got, I think they stopped counting the uniques on this. But it got to lots, uh, like 50 million or something. Uh, so it's not Drupal, it's a static HTML, because why would you need Drupal for this? That's like, you know, really is cracking a, a nut with a sledgehammer. Uh, you just needed something that's very, very lightweight, extremely lightweight, uh, and on its own. They could just drop in. It hardly ever happens, this. Now, 
the, like I said, the challenge of these updates is, is uh, this is how physicists are used to seeing updates in CERN. <laughs> this is page one, it's called, which is brilliant, page one. Uh, and this is dotted around CERN on big screens. It's like there's one in the cafeteria. It's great. People eating their lunch, looking at it. <laughs> um, the worrying thing is I know what some of these things mean now, which is ter slightly terrifying. But you see that there's such a disconnect. That's what I'm trying to get to. There's, and you'll see this in other organizations, other businesses. There's a massive disconnect between what the organization thinks the users of their website need and in the language that they'll understand it. And there's a huge, even though CERN's got a really great press team and they do a lot of work to make sure that that language is, is appropriate and it'll issue press releases out to newspapers and things like that. But they struggle with it because they're in there every day in the organization. Very, very hard for them to just reach out and go, oh, I'm sorry, you didn't understand that. So we've had to put in place editorial processes to make sure that this, uh, this doesn't happen much. So one of the things is the, the um, applied wonder. So we, we, how do you make that scale? I talked about that scale. Apply the, the wonder scale against the comprehension. So we did it very, very simply. This is the home page. That's one of my favorite images. It's beautiful, that's from Alice. Um, so we have the home page, it's very high wonder. This is for the general public. This isn't for Bob the physicist. He's not, he's not bothered about that. Um, the about section is the way that we underpin uh, the page with just a simple graphic, a simple textural, meaningless in many ways. There's no context on this. It's just a pretty picture of space and nothing more. There's a terrible tendency with designers to over-rationalize stuff that is just beautiful. Uh, there's a great, uh, a great designer who called it the, the design escalation problem, I think he called it, which is where a client comes to you for a logo, and you go, nah, I'll do your logo, but what you really need is a corporate identity. Uh, and then you go, naturally, no, what you really need is a, is a, is a design system. No, what you really need is a, is a business strategy. Your business strategy is all wrong. Up we go. And, and the, the danger of that is that you lose sight of, of what a lot of designers get into design for, which is just to make beautiful things. Uh, so we did that on here. We had some fun with beautiful images. And these are textural. They're not meant to mean anything. They're just meant to underpin the content, give the content some context. I mean, it's just a blue shape. It doesn't really mean anything. But my mom thinks it's pretty general public. Physicists, however, don't want any of that crap. Give me text, nothing but. We have brilliant meetings with some physicists. We, so one of the things is that, uh, on the, the, the system of uh, getting the, the visualizations to Drupal via another Drupal was like magic. Uh, it's taken a long time for that actually to happen because the experiments are spitting out stuff that's proprietary. It has to go through conversions. It has to go into a kind of a, a, a repository where captions are added by certain people. And um, we were sat in a meeting with a, with a physicist uh, representing an experiment, just saying, like, we, you know, we need, we need uh, talking all through this. She's getting increasingly bored. And actually, she started getting really angry. I could see it. I could see it happening, but I couldn't stop talking about it, because I was, you know, it's kind of a well-rehearsed spiel. So I, I kind of was just like, ah, oh, she's getting really cross. So um, in the end, she just was like, I'll give you whatever you want, in whatever language you want it. I'm a physicist. <laughs> I sat there going, oh, how to make a dumb web designer look dumb. I'm a physicist. She actually said those words. That's yeah, brilliant. So they want text. So this is low wonder. It's not meant to be fancy schmancy. It is designed specifically for that audience group to get what they need. It's very legible. Uh, the wayfinding is easy. It's easy to get around. That's what they need. So I mentioned Drupal very briefly. I mean, this is why I talk about Drupal. 55 minutes into my talk. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so we've done a bunch of drupal -y things for CERN. The first thing is to make a, CERN is a, uh, all of the, so they've gone from kind of just HTML, as they would, because they, you know, kind of invented the web. Uh, they've gone from crappy HTML stuff uh, all the way through a whole bunch of other systems uh, for people making websites. So the people that make websites at CERN are users, so if you're a user, a CERN user, uh, you can have a website. Uh, and there's 30,000 websites thereabouts, and that includes departmental websites. The idea is that any new website will be built on a shared infrastructure, shared design patterns, shared. So one of our jobs was to create a theme for Drupal that would be uh, a base theme with some uh, very small amount of controls to give some variance between different uh, different sites. So this would be an example of a, uh, an engineering department site. So they can change the colors uh, to Zazolda. They can change the, uh, the kind of the top story there. Very, very small changes, but with some imagination, they can look fairly different. Uh, we also built a timelines application. It doesn't look like this. Uh, you'll be pleased to know. CERN has a whole bunch of timeline. It's a very historic place. It was, you know, at the end of the war, really, that it kind of all came together because there were all these nuclear physicists around. Um, somebody was like, uh, there's loads of nuclear physicists knocking about. We better get them all together and do nice, peaceful things. Um, so that's what happened. Uh, and the timeline, because it's such a historic place, there's all these interweaving timelines. Things like uh, supersymmetry. Right? Has anyone heard of supersymmetry? Good. Maybe you could explain what it is because I haven't the foggiest. But supersymmetry, in fact, don't. Supersymmetry started off in the 60s, I believe. It was postulated then. It kind of stopped. And it was only last year when there was enough energy in the collider and enough data to support, uh, to support the findings that they ruled it out. Actually, it was a load of rubbish. So an interview with the guy who did it, and it's like his life's work, right? And he's like, I think it's brilliant. <laughs> Such a liar. Gutted. I mean, totally gutted. Um, so so we, we, we were thinking, right, well, how do we show the timelines start in the 60s, then they stop for a whole bunch of time, and then they start up again? So lots of different timelines, lots of different overlapping timelines as well. Uh, so we built a system that basically Drupal spits out timelines for us to embed. And eventually, these will be embeddable all over the web. You can take a certain timeline, and you can just pop it in somewhere like you would Google Maps, um, which is pretty cool. So we did that. Um, so where now? Well, there's a lot to do still. We're working to the project to the end of uh, the year. Um, we're building a, a, a pattern library for CERN. So some of the things that you've seen today will be then shared and used across those websites in CERN. The idea being that you know, it's, a big, it's a big organization. It makes sense for one department to invent a carousel and for another department to use that carousel instead of inventing a new one. Uh, how that works in practice is a totally other story. Because uh, a community that has little or no hierarchical structure, well, there is some, but it, it's very, very difficult. People just do what they want. Ah, I'll just do it. And I learned very early in the project not to fight that. And I think that comes back to you know, some of the lessons learned on the Drupal projects that I worked on, where you know, I found something so important that I go into issue queues and I'm like, really trying to argue these points. And I think I've learned when to just go, you know what? Fine. I think it's one of, one of the, 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 the most valuable lessons that I learned in those two projects. And it, it played well in a meeting I had at CERN where we have this toolbar. You probably saw it on a couple of the screenshots. It goes across the top. Um, that's a Drupal module. Uh, one of the departments wanted to take that module, fork it, and put navigation in it. I was like, yeah, you might not want to do that because of all of this rationale and reasoning and research that has got us to this point. And they were like, yeah, I think we'll do it anyway. And we're like, all right then. And that was it. That was a meeting. <laughs> they were like, left. And I was like, uh, you know what? I'm not going to get upset about that. Um, 
We're also working on a, on a um, uh, so there's a, a, a page in, if you're logged in to the CERN website as a CERN user, you don't get all that fancy schmancy homepage with stuff. You get a page that hasn't changed in about 12 years. And it's just a page of links. A million bazillion links. And we're working to redesign that in some way and bring a bit more user functionality into it so that, that people can have their own predefined, uh, predefined points. That is incredibly painful. You know, you, 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 you take users who've been using the same page for 12 years. That's never happened in my career. I just go here and click this link, and it's like they're, it's like they're riding a bike or they're, they're eating. It's a completely automatic response. Yeah. How do you redesign something like that? A lot of people in CERN think we should leave it the hell alone. Sometimes, in the project, I'm inclined to agree. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip through these pretty quick. We learned some good stuff. And I hope that, uh, well, first thing, that open design is really hard. It's hard because of the, it goes against our natural inclinations as designers. Um, and failing publicly and openly is really, really hard to take on the chin sometimes, especially in an environment where design is rewarded with, by, uh, it's rewarded if data is provided. Uh, so you guys may see this in the Drupal community. I've seen it in other communities, and we saw it at CERN, which is, you give me proof, and I'll believe what you say. And that's very difficult to design in that environment because it actually nurtures an environment where risks aren't taken as much because it's a total pain to do, produce an idea, prototype it, research it, get findings that back up what you're thinking is, then present it. And this happens all the time in, a, in, in open, open design. Um, we learned that content, don't ignore the content problem on a project. The content is really, really important. The, uh, the whole um, movement of content first is, is, again, siloing content. And content's been siloed for long enough. You used to be at the end of a project. right? Here's, you do the project, and then you go, right, client, write all your content. And they go, what? Because there's this mountain like this. They're like, oh, I'm never going to get this done. And they don't. And now content first is taking that and putting it at the start. So you never start your project because the client's going, oh, oh, and you don't actually know what that content should be. And because content changes and ebbs and flows throughout a, a project. So content shouldn't be first or last. It should be all the time. Content all the time. That should be a, a new movement. Maybe I'll write a book. Such a catchy title. Um, editorial people are co total control freaks because that's what they do. Uh, it's taken me a long time. I used to work at the BBC. Where I work with news organizations now and sport networks. And this is pretty much true across the board, is that editorial people, writers, broadcasters, journalists, they control the message, in the, or they want to, in the same way that designers control the design. Uh, now, we are coming to terms with the fact on the web that uh, the notion of control was only ever really a lie. It's like the matrix. It was a lie. We live in a lie, lying to ourselves. Um, and I'm hopeful that editorial will eventually get to the same point because they can't control the way people consume and read content on the web. It's an, it, you just can't do it. And especially where it comes to like press releases and this very structured way of releasing content to the world. You know, that, that's been there since, you know, the dinosaurs. Uh, big physics hurts. My brain uh, hurts. And big engineering hurts. So there's a lot of pain. So not that that means anything to you, but it, uh, it sure makes me feel better saying it. Um, opening up is good. So as designers, or, or whoever you are, talk about your work whilst you're doing your work. I think that's, that's key. Don't wait to the end and do a presentation. Uh, talk about your work along the way. Study design critique. Uh, even if you're not a designer, read up on design critique. Um, learn about how to critique design in a way that a designer will understand what the hell you're not talking about and not be defensive. And that's me. Thank you very much.
I don't know if we've got any time for questions because I've like gone.